set your cruise control and crank up the volume. This is the Drive History Podcast. Well, welcome to the first episode of the Drive History Podcast. My name is Brian Corey. I'm the author at automotivehistory.org. And I'm joined today by Jordan Stead, who is your friend, car enthusiast, <laughs> and general guy who knows a lot of useless knowledge about a small number of things. That's a good way to be, though. Yeah. It's, it's better than knowing a lot about one thing, I feel like. I suppose so, yeah. Also on the mic, Dylan Kane, the owner of the Import Guys. Uh, happy to have you here. What's going on, Dylan? I'm here. I'm all right. You pulled it off. You pulled it off. Yeah. Um, so... I think the format of this is going to evolve quickly over time, but given the website and who might or might not be listening to this, hopefully might, uh, you're used to getting daily automotive facts. And we're going to kind of run down that same format uh, at a week at a time. And given that it's February 13th, we're going to start with February 13th. At least that's the day it'll be when this comes out, hopefully. So... If you guys have something interesting to say about any of these facts, please feel free to add your two cents. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep on trucking. Speaking of trucks, on February 13th, 1953, William C. Mack, one of the brothers who founded the Mack Trucks company, died. My only connection to Mack Trucks is my first parental advisory record that I ever had was Kid Rock, Devil Had a Cause. My dad bought it for me, and I was like, Seven. I definitely should not have been listening to that record at the time. But all he did was talk about Mack trucks, like cons- consistently throughout the entire record. Like it was like a, he like Kid thought Rock. it was cool. Yeah. Man, I don't remember that record. Yeah. It was an amazing album. Even if you don't like Kid Rock, which is a whole different story now in 2024, <laughs> it was 20 years ago. But a little I less ball with the ball. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. It was the ball with the ball record. Exactly. But the, I just distinctly remember being a child and being like, why is this adult man constantly referencing Mack trucks? It's like my first memory of Mack trucks. Moving on. In 1958, on February 13th, Ford unveiled the four-seat Ford Thunderbird. It had originally come out in 55 as a coupe uh, and a convertible two-seater to compete with the Chevrolet Corvette. But uh, they saw more potential in it as a family a uh, sports car, I guess you would call something like that. But uh, it it did work. They added about a foot and a half and sold about 200,000 more units over the next three years than the first three years. So Interesting. You know, I hate to start this podcast off on a negative note, but the the most recent Thunderbird, like, resto mod version <laughs> that came out in the early 2000s, I think has got to be one of my least favorite cars ever. I think the early 2000s was one of the most beautiful periods of auto production ever. My uncle has one of us. He cherishes it pretty dearly. Oh, I'm sure. Like, I feel like people who were like willing enough to buy that vehicle are people that would just absolutely obsess over it until the end of time. Well, I feel like that's who the target audience was with that. somebody who bought one in 1955, wanted one in 2005 that looked the same, but you know, had all the modern amenities. They only made 30,000 of them in the, the, new ones, the you mean? yeah the last three years of it, 2002 to five or whatever. That explains why I've probably seen like five of them in my life. Yeah. And everybody wants to sell them for $25,000 still, but they're right. like $3,000 Tauruses. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, two of those 30,000 are down the street from my house. And I drive by one every day, leaving my house. And I'm like, God, I just, I can't do it. I don't, I just don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> Doesn't even have, like, I don't know. I feel like the homage isn't even there. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think you have to get it. You have to drive it. <laughs> I heard that. It's horrible, too. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Here's one for you, Don. Uh, on February 13th, 1991, Nissan announced the domestic release of the Figaro. What's that? Oh, come on. <laughs> Do you want to give us a little history on that? Yeah, uh... The only way to get one was through a lottery system in Japan, and they only made the cars for one year. They had four different colors and one would each, one was for each season of the year. There's like a, a winter, a fall, a spring, and a summer car. Which one's fastest? Um, <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> what? what? No. <laughs> Which one is fastest? I'm, I'm joking. Uh, 
<laughs> it's obviously the summer talk. Yeah. What's the deal with the factory that they came out of? Uh, the Nissan Pipe Factory. Which is? Uh, the Pipe Factory did a bunch of retro-themed cars in the, <clears throat> in the 90s for Nissan. They did things like the, the V1, the PAL, the S Cargo, and the Figaro. And you have a Figaro, don't you? I do have a Figaro. I also have an S Cargo. Uh, they were built off the Nissan Micra slash March platform. So cool. Such a cool car. What season do you have? I have a spring, and my dad, I think, his is summer. He has one also. A family <laughs> affair? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. When, when we went to Japan, uh, I went with my dad and my brother. My dad, like, Strong armed my brother to buying one there as well at the auction. It was the fall car, and, and now he's on this kick of having one of each color. So, what you're saying is 30 something years later, the marketing is still working. It's still working. Is it hard to get those cars still? Uh, yeah, it is, it is. They're pretty rare. They didn't make that many of them. Um, yeah, I, I think it's like 20,000 altogether. Yeah. That's right. Uh, well, staying on that side of the ocean, uh, we're moving into February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. Hmm. February 14th, 1867, Sakichi Toyota is born. He founded Toyota Automatic Loom Works in Japan, uh, forming the basis for what would eventually become Toyota Motor Company. God bless. He passed away in 1933, years before his son Kichiro established the car division of the family business, which was essentially the, the first car that Toyota built was, I think, like a knockdown, essentially a replica of a 1934, 35 Chrysler Airflow. Um, if you look at it, it looks, looks dead on. They just took it apart, took one apart, reverse engineered it, and then built their own version of it, essentially. What is, what is an automatic loom work? I think it's like a, like sewing. Okay, yeah, like, right, like a loom. Okay, yeah. I, I think he like, invented could the. Could this be it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wow, it's kind of a little bit of a jump to the car division, but you know, hey, it worked, I guess. Opal made sewing machines before they made cars. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, really? Huh. And rockets. But <laughs> Opal made rockets. Yeah, I guess that was after they started building cars too. But uh, huh. they did do some 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 rocket stuff. How's the Toyota market? Supras, Elexus, Surfs, those are always pretty popular, pretty cool. Um, we just got a Surf for someone the other day. It was like a 30,000 mile car, turbo diesel. What's a Surf? It's it's pretty much a forerunner. It, oh, it is a forerunner, but it's better um, because it's the JDM version. Don't tell that to anybody who drives a forerunner. Yeah. <laughs> or did uh, they sell Hiluxes in Japan? Uh, yeah, they did. Yeah, I feel like that's the thing that everybody wants here. That although I, I don't know what the import situation is there, what years they were out. But I mean, I feel like that's the that's the Toyota that everyone thinks they have when they buy another Toyota. Like, oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> what kind of sucks is importing trucks into the U.S. has a twenty five percent duty. Chicken tax. It's so bad. 25%? So they, yeah, dude. And so you'll go buy a Helix in Japan and whatever, like a nice one's 25 grand or something. So then you pay. I mean, you do the math on that. <laughs> I feel it's cool. So 20, <laughs> 25% of that, that's a lot of money. That's like six grand, right? Uh, yeah, it is. Just, to, just, to, just on the tax to get it across. And then you got to still pay the shipping and everything. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's horrible. So when you do see them in the U.S., that's why there's so much money. I mean, someone paid five, six, seven thousand on duty alone. So do you only import stuff like that when it's a customer request? Yeah, just because of the duties. I just, I don't know. No, that makes it's sense. It's a bigger risk for you, for sure, especially if somebody doesn't totally. want. Totally. Yeah, I know they they would sell, but it's just I don't know. It's hard. To, justify six grand of duties on some old Toyota truck. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and there's, I mean, there's so many cool Toyotas, especially in JDM nineties world. We could talk about that for a whole day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I, I got, a, I got a big thing for chasers. So bad. Yeah. So cool. There's just so many cool Toyotas from the nineties. What are the, the V12 ones? Century. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like the, the limo E. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Those things are wild. Japan does cars, right? Uh, you know who didn't do cars right? It's Chrysler. <laughs> uh, on this day, February 14th, the year 2000, the Chrysler PT Cruiser began production. 1.35 million would be built by the time production ended in 2010. All of them coming out of the Toluca, Mexico plant. Absolutely insane. There's like two things that blow my mind most about this. One that really has a lot less to do with PT Cruisers than the other. But the first thing is I just recently saw this documentary about, uh, it was called Y2K, The Boom or something like that. And it was this hour and a half long documentary that basically revisited what the late 90s leading up to Y2K was like for people with I remember like Y2K people were right. really afraid the world's gonna explode, banking systems are gonna fail. That's this whole movie created with found footage from the nineties. There's no narration, there's no net new footage, there's no recreations. It's all footage from the nineties. And as someone who I grew up as a nineties kid, like all of us did basically, that it, like it was such a time capsule of a of a movie and it just brought me back to this such a nostalgic but, but there's no narration. There's nothing. It's just None. just watching life in the yeah, like, and seeing 90s. like how how the world was preparing for Y2K, how the government and the release of the PT Cruiser. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I was just thinking like that like, that era just is so rooted. Like the PT Cruiser look and feel is so rooted in the Y2K section of my brain. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and the could the cool thing that I always think about with PT Cruisers. I know that's a sentence no one's ever said, is the special editions that they oh, had. There was a billion of them. <laughs> Literally a bazillion of them. And there was one of them that had uh, the Viper V10 in it. What? And all these crazy... Oh, I saw that. Yeah, man. It's insane. And and they had these really cool... Well, again, cool is the operative word, but... Funny, you had to get the convertible. Yeah, <laughs> man. They had the convertible one. They had the one that had like the surfboards in the back. They had all these it's like a flame edition. Flame edition. They had a bunch of really cool cultural moments too. Where uh, I can't remember if there was a if it was Space Jam or it was, there was like a couple of movies that had come out in that time, um, and they had done like a special edition PT Cruiser, you know, themed and colored from all these uh, movies in the early two thousand. Yeah. It's just the time capsule nostalgia bomb that drops on me when I think about that is wild. Do you think they're collector items yet? I think people think they're collector items. But I-, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the same with like the, I mean, I'm a big uh, fan of the 1980s minivans, but you can find the turbo five speed ones. And if you can get the right combo PT cruiser, like yeah. there's some rare ones. It's the same with, I mean, like you were talking about the Thunderbird that came out in 2002 or whatever, that whole era of just like weird retro cars, the HHR, the SSR, the Prowler, like the Prowler just made Hagerty's, you know, bull market list saying that's going to go up in value. And uh, I'm one of those suckers that for some reason wants one because I had one on a poster, you know, on my wall. I mean, kid. off topic, probably the saddest combination of chassis and engine <laughs> miscalculation ever. I think that a lot of people will fight you on that. I agree with you, but everybody, it's again, it's like, oh, my cat's in here. Uh, everybody says you got to drive it. And it's like a torquey little V6 and it gets you up to speed, but it also only had an automatic, which is the most disappointing part of it. Of course, you can't buy anything with a stick these days. I've seen those in Japan. The Prowler? Yeah. Oh. It strikes me as the thing that like all of us Americans want all the Japanese cars, <laughs> and all the Japanese want all the uh, weird American cars that we had. Yeah. Were they sold over there, Dylan? We're, 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 uh, no. Oh, okay, yeah. Nope. You were just talking about Dodge Caravans with five speeds, right? Yeah. yeah okay. This one time I was in Japan driving down the freeway, and I saw this uh, I saw this old guy driving one. I don't know the transmission or anything, right? But it was like actually super cool. It was painted in this really nice blue, and it was slammed on like these thirteen inch wheels with uh, 
like a chain steering wheel in that. What? It's like embedded in my head, this van. I saw it like seven years ago, and it's just the wildest thing ever. Well, I feel like Japan knows how to build cars, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. It also like feels like an American trying to do their best Bosuzoku impression. <laughs> I love that. I respect it. You got to build that, Dill. Yeah. Uh, all right. Enough Kiki Cruiser baloney. February 15th, 1936, BMW launched the 326 at the Berlin Motor Show, uh, marking the first BMW four-door. I had a two-door, I had a convertible, 1998, 323i. Probably a little faster than that thing, but uh, that's basically my experience with BMW. And it was fine. It, it was... My daily driver, I didn't do anything cool with it. Uh, I know that you were just looking at a BMW. I mean, everyone's always looking at BMW. Yeah. <laughs> <right? laughs> my, my BMW, like, I guess, 320X thing was my dad had a 88 325 uh, five-speed, like, gunmetal gray, black leather interior he had when I was a kid. And if we wouldn't have gotten T-boned on the top of Capitol, oh, that would have been probably my first car. It was it was awesome. Well, coupe it was beautiful. Dude. And it's in the junkyard oh, somewhere. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in a Hyundai now. Yeah. I think it was cool, though. It's really cool. That's sad. I will never have one of those. Uh, here's something we can breeze by. Uh, 1963, February 15th, Studebaker, which I don't know if either of you knows what that is. <laughs> My grandma had one. <laughs> that sounds about right. There's a Studemaker museum up here around where we live. I've never been to it. It's like a private collection slash museum. In huh? In Bellingham? Yeah, some somewhere out in Whatcom County. I don't oh, know. That's pretty cool. I guess that. It'd be cool. But on this day, February 15, 1963, Studebaker announced that it was going to have seat belts in all of its new cars in the front seat only. Could you imagine a time when that was the news? And it was an uproar. People didn't want to wear seatbelts. It's like nowadays when there's any sort of new safety uh, equipment added to vehicles. Nobody wants to use that. And there's still people who don't even put their seatbelt on. You know, I'll take a seatbelt over a uh, lane merging control module. <laughs> what do we get now? Any day. <laughs> you don't like the beeps? <laughs> Come on. Um, all right. We're going to get back to the funky Mopars really quick. On February 15th, 2002, the last Chrysler Prowl, last Chrysler Prowler, that's hard to say. Originally, the Plymouth Prowler left the assembly line. Uh, Between 1997 and 2002, only 11,702 Prowlers were built, all of them with a V6 and an automatic transmission, as we were mentioning earlier. An interesting combination. I'm on team. That's dumb. I know a lot of people say that it's a well-built uh, little V6 that gives it some oomph. But if I can't roll my own gears and it doesn't have a big loud V8, it just seems like a weird car. It should have a V8. It looks like it should have one. Totally. They should have put like the Viper V10 in it or yeah. whatever they were doing. Yeah, those I know, right? I need to do that. That sounds more necessary. And a quick Google or YouTube search could probably solve this or answer this question for me, but something is telling me the reason why we haven't seen a lot of like Prowler modifications, or maybe I just haven't crawled around that corner of the internet yet. Something's telling me just the design of the body is probably hard to modify or drop a bigger engine or something. I imagine that's probably why you don't see people dropping, you know. Uh, totally. There is one that I know of somebody put in some modern Hemi engine in it yeah. and swapped out like for a six speed or something like that. Yeah. Like probably out of a Hellcat or some, some sort of situation. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're right. But the fabrication work was crazy. Yeah. I, th- I think that'd like move the firewall back. Cause I mean, it's just a little triangle up there. Yeah. yeah. You had to build a whole new car basically. Yeah. <laughs> it is <laughs> not a prowler. Redesign the prowler. <laughs> uh, I, I did ride in one as a young star. It's probably like, 15 or something and you know as a youthful car person it was very exciting at the time and again i i would still like if, if somebody gave one to me i would definitely keep it <laughs> it's one of those cars that's just like kind of iconic for all the wrong reasons I mean, chip boost partially designed it 
Uh, it was Plymouth's last attempt at survival, and it didn't work. It didn't end up working. I just had like a, I had to Google the Prowler to see a photo because I was like, wait, where did you ride in a Prowler? Like, how many seats did it have? I'm like, oh yeah, okay, it's <laughs> yeah. I like couldn't picture the like cabin for a second. All I was thinking about was just the front of the triangle. It's like an Indica. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, moving forward. Here's something that might be interesting to you guys. If you like luxury vehicles, February 16th, 1843, Henry Leland, uh, the founder of Cadillac and Lincoln was born February 16th, 1843. He formed Cadillac in 1902, uh, when the Henry Ford company, Henry Ford's second attempt at starting the car company was failing. The other investors came to Leland in Detroit, asked him to kind of run inventory and tell him what the what the company was worth uh, so that they could liquidate it. And he instead convinced them to rebrand it as Cadillac and use an engine of his design. And so if you look at the 1902, 1903 Cadillacs and Fords, they're essentially the same car because Henry Ford quickly turned around and started what is now Ford Motor Company as he was successful on the third attempt. But he was quite spiteful uh, with old Henry Leland for essentially swiping his failed car company out from under him and starting Cadillac. So fast forward to, I think, 1922. Uh, Leland had started Lincoln during World War I to build airplane engines. And as he transitioned into building luxury cars, he was not cash flow positive. Company went into bankruptcy. And Henry Ford was the only person to make an offer on the company, uh, bidding, I think, $5 million dollars. And, and the company had been estimated, uh, had its worth estimated at 16 million. And so he intentionally lowballed purely as a you know, way to get back at Henry Leland for kind of stealing his thunder back in the day. A judge denied that offer and he ended up buying it for 8 million. And Ford has owned Lincoln since, since the 1920s. I think that the cat has a lot of input. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, we only have three mics, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, then here we are in 2024, and we now have 700 horsepower Cadillac SUVs. So, right. Glad this all worked out. It's just crazy. That guy started the two primary American luxury brands almost 20 years apart, and both of them survived to this day. And you think about how, you know, Thousands of car companies were around over those times, like literally, especially in the early days. And it just proves he knew what he was doing, I guess. Well, or not, because he had to sell out to Henry Ford. <laughs> but yeah, and I mean, this is sort of on topic, but for some reason, the new Lincoln Aviator to me is such a good-looking car. Like as far as gigantic, boxy uh, SUV big cars go, like new ones, it's really kind of nice looking. But the design is cool. Dig it. Do you think they started developing it to kind of combat the, the Wagoneer? Or maybe. Well, obviously, the, you know, that car's been out for a long time. Uh, but this generation, like, I feel like that there's a lot of, a big market for the big luxury SUVs again. You know, kind of in the early 2000s, you had the Ford Excursion and all these kinds of things. And maybe escalating that was, world was. Yeah, Escalade world. Yeah, I want an Escalade truck. Oh, yeah, EXT. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, I support that. Damn. Um, also on February 16th, 1997, Jeff Gordon won the Daytona uh, Daytona 500 at age 25. Youngest winner to date. I'm not a big NASCAR person. That's pretty sweet, though. Yeah. February 17th, 1920. It's announced the London Metropolitan Police would replace their horses with cars. The first department in Britain to officially do so. 1920 was late i mean cars have been around at that point you know regularly for at least 20 years and probably like at an affordable rate for since 1910 1912 kind of a late bloomer in the in the police department i never even thought about this but now that i'm like this hadn't even occurred to me but so what happens when someone committed a crime jumps in a car and they're running away and the cops are like well we have horses so well, cars only went like four miles an hour. Oh, true. <laughs> true. <laughs> there's, there's good stories. Of, I, I think like the first speeding ticket ever written in Britain, the guy got pulled over uh, by a cop on a bicycle. 
So he's going eight miles an hour. <laughs> Find one shilling. Um, Dylan, what's the slowest car in the shop right now? What do you have? Uh, uh, the slowest car? Well, geez, they're all so slow. Uh, <laughs> I think that the Daihatsu Midget, that's pretty slow. What are it still goes like six feet. Really? Don't this have like a one cylinder? It's a three cylinder, six sixty cc, four speed. Some of them have a five speed, and you can go like seventy five with that. That's Watch out. terrifying. You can, should you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you could rent those out to people who want to go running, but they're too lazy to run, so they just drive a Daihatsu Midget around because it feels yeah. like you're running because that car is just a cardboard box on wheels. <laughs> Uh, you burn about the same amount of calories because you're terrified to drive it. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's for the person that needs to get to the golf hole faster than a regular golf. Yeah, car. yeah, for real. Uh, 1966, February 17th, former GM president Alfred Sloan dies. He became the president in 1923 and chairman of the board in 1937, and then retired from GM as chairman in 1956. He contributed a lot to the auto market uh, or the auto industry. Um, he's credited with annual styling changes, uh, resulting in the term we now call planned obsolescence. Another one of his prime achievements was establishing the pricing ladder of vehicle brands under GM, going from Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and then up to Cadillac. Um, but you can thank him for your iPhone getting updated every year. <laughs> February 18th, 1898, Enzo Ferrari is born. Dylan, thanks for letting me drive that Ferrari one time. Oh, yeah, of course. What was that thing? Uh, that was a Ferrari California. You just did a Ferrari experience. I did. I, For someone who's as interested in cars as, as I am, I've driven like very few compelling cars, but uh, I I did like most the Fiat 500 is not compelling. <laughs> it was a car. Okay. <laughs> uh, I in Vegas did like many do like the dream racing experience, and I got to drive a, uh, a 488 Pista on track. And it was incredible, and it was like by far and away like six, six maybe 600 horsepower, 500 horsepower Delta, from then the fastest car that I drove before that. So. <laughs> So shout out Enzo, appreciate you. Just the sound alone is enough to kind of. They sound so good. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Really good. I was just at the Peterson Museum in LA, and they have an incredible Ferrari collection in the vault, including what is essentially the very first Ferrari badged car. It was unclear to me. One of the Dustins said it was the first Ferrari. I have heard them accepting that as true. Uh, but it, I think it's like a 1948 or something. Oh. Even back then, it had a V12. Just insane. What? Yeah. A car from 1948? Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And it probably made like 80 horsepower. Yeah. <laughs> Top speed of 30. <laughs> no. <laughs> the torque, though. <no. laughs> uh, February 18th, 1965, the Mercury Cougar is approved for production. The Mercury Cougar basically just being a more expensive Ford Mustang. Uh, essentially or eventually evolved into the the last ones in the 1990s, and every single one of them was painted gold, it seemed like. Yeah, the champagne. Yeah. The champagne Taurus, champagne gold. Or oh, yeah. February 18th, 2001, Dale Earnhardt Jr. dies at Daytona 500 on the last lap. R.I.P. I remember watching that. Like, I actually taped that Daytona really? 500. That was, what, 13, I guess? And I think we were going skiing and i asked my mom to tape the daytona 500 even though i was not even into like racing that much but the cool thing to do was tape stuff from 2001 apparently you still have the vhs yeah. somewhere i i think i do I, I believe it's around it's probably not worth anything i'll sell it to you <laughs> you always want to sell something <laughs> February 19th, 1932 ford unveils its first model specifically designed for the british markets the model y essentially just like a model a but half the size because every road in Europe is tiny. Maybe the dumbest question ever or maybe something that other people are 
wondering as well is Ford Model Y, Tesla Model Y. Wonder what the like copyright situation is there. Well, here is uh, thirty-two. Yeah, I mean, hmm, trademarks. Uh, also, can you it's, just like I think it, it doesn't go with car manufacturers outside of countries because in Japan there's like the Nissan Caravan, and it was made the same year the Dodge Caravan was, and it even kind of looks the same. Huh. That's interesting. They probably yeah. just ripped it off. Well, Dodd probably ripped them off. Uh, yeah, I don't know how that works. Because I remember hearing something that uh, Tesla act, like wanted to do a Model T or something, but they couldn't do that one, but they did the other oh, I, I ones. But I don't know like if that actually is... I don't know, it's, all, it's all hearsay uh, in my book, but that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. I think the Model Y from Tesla is slightly faster than the Model, <laughs> Model Y from 1932. All right, last on this list leads us into a little bit longer of a story. On February 19th, 2015, the first president of Nissan Motor Company, USA, Yutaka Katayama, passes away at age 105. So I guess this brings us to the last segment of this uh little podcast that we're trying to figure out. But uh, I wanted to tell the story of Yutaka Katayama. And I would love for you guys to write any comments if you have them. Hey, Yutaka Katayama, Mr. K, if you will, was often hailed as the father of the Z car, was born Yutaka Aso on September 15th, 1909. He was born into a relatively wealthy family that allowed him to travel often. However, despite being richy rich, the kid had to work. By age 20, he'd become a ship's clerk, a job he'd hold prior to entering college. On one such voyage in the late 1920s, he ended up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, after carrying a cargo of silk to Vancouver, his ship ferried a handful of passengers down to Seattle. And by several accounts, it was here in the great Pacific Northwest where he truly experienced the pleasure, power, and awe of the automobile for the first time. So he returned to Japan uh, with his new fascination and entered university. And he graduated in 1935 and immediately landed a job with Nissan, uh, which had only been organized the year before. It's a little bit confusing, the Nissan origin story, and so I tried to outline it here pretty briefly. But there was a Japanese company called DAT, D-A-T, uh, that had started building cars in 1914. And by the early 1930s, it had been acquired by a holding company called Nihon Sangoyo, Sang- Sangyo, perhaps, which was abbreviated as Nissan on the stock market, uh, ticker tape in Japan. And after the founder acquired what had become of DOT, he reorganized it in 1934 into the Nissan Motor Company. So if you're confused, just look it up because I barely get it myself. Uh, so Mr. K starts working there in 1935, the same year they started to build cars. His initial role was in the administration department where he handled publicity and advertising. And if you recall, he was born in Utah, so, but in 1937, he married and he took his wife's last name because there was no sons in that family. And it was the nice thing to do so that that name could live on. So he became Yutaka Kateyama. In another act of defiance, he refused multiple orders during World War II, which he says would have surely sent him to his death. Alas, he survived and continued to lead Nissan's advertising efforts. I couldn't find the year on this, but he is cited as one of the first to make a color film of a Datsun on Japanese roads and later film motorsports races. There's a lot of talk about how he kind of shaped automotive storytelling like in the 1940s through 60s. Uh, so if you love shooting cars and taking video, you can thank him for setting the stage for that. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. And at the end of the 1950s, he became the Nissan racing manager. And so in 1958, his efforts saw two dots and two tens win their class in the grueling mobile gas around Australia trial, a 10,000 mile rally across the Australian outback. And on the heels of that victory, Nissan realized that they had the power to start exporting given their newfound fame. So Mr. K rises through the ranks, wins races, helps organize the first Tokyo Auto Show, and then gets sent to the U.S. in 1960 and is handed the title of president of Nissan Motor Company USA. 
His job is to begin building a dealer network in the States using the Datsun trade name. How? Well, apparently he started talking used car dealers into selling the unknown automaker's products stateside. And it worked. So by 1967, the Datsun 510 didn't carry of a Datsun. Was that the car he sold to the murderer? No, that was Kerry. Yeah. Didn't he? Was uh, it a Datsun 510? Yeah, I think so. Basically, long story short, our friend sold the car to a murderer and then had to go to the trial when the murderer was caught. That's a story for a different episode <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> we'll get Kerry in here. Yeah. <laughs> so by 1967, the Datsun 510 began to hit the shores of the United States and the brand grabbed a piece, albeit small, of auto sales from domestic automakers. It was at that time that speed came back into play uh, when Mr. K dreamed up his parts bin special. In 1970, the Fairlady Z hit the market. Buyutaka couldn't see the name appealing to American buyers. He he re-christened... Re, he re-christened... Christened? Christened. <laughs> he re-christened... He re-christened... <laughs> Can I not say that? <laughs> <laughs> we've got a stroke. We got a stroke live on the podcast. <laughs> he rechristened the Fair Lady Z, the 240Z in the States. It was five ten base car that became Nissan's first official sports car. Now, Dylan, I know that you just sold one of these. That was a fairly uh, uh, low mileage example, right? Yeah, I just sold one with 15,000 miles. Um, that was a nice car. I've definitely had my fair share. Of you sound real thrilled about that. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I have a, a 240Z and a, um, a fairly Z, like a 1990, give or take, the C32 twin turbo model. Oh, yes. Favorite, one of the faves. They're like the wide, like frog looking ones, right? Yeah. Yeah, those are pretty cool. When did the 370Z come out, or 350Z come out? Like the re. 2003. Oh, so you're about to be able to bring those over here, the, the Japanese yeah, ones. Yeah, it's not, it's not that far off. Yeah, there's a gap where there was no Z car. I don't know if you know that or not. For like four years, they didn't make any Z cars. Was there a big difference between the like the 350s in Japan and the 350s here, like in the early 2000s? Yeah, the steering wheel's on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, uh, maybe it has a TV in it or something. Uh, DVD players in there. Yeah. A fridge. Um, well, to wrap this up, he would... Still, uh, he would oversee Nissan Datsun in the U.S. until 1977 when he retired, but he still continued to give his two cents on the auto industry for years and years, especially in relation to Nissan. On his 100th birthday, he did call out Nissan, saying the Miata was taking the place of the 240Z as the 370, or maybe it was the 3, no, 370Z at that point, was too heavy and too pricey. It's true. It still is. Yeah. I feel like nobody's making a car like the Miata except Mazda. Yeah, I don't know. Did anyone ever compare the 370Z to the Miata? I feel like I've never... Well, I think what he was... What he was referring to was like the the older models and how it was just like a driver and a car. I see. An actual sports car. Yeah, that makes sense. I think his philosophy with designing the Z was something about like it should be like riding a horse. Like you're just like connected. (laughs) Um, What? Then why did mine break down on me? <laughs> <laughs> did you have to shoot it? <laughs> uh, he's quoted as saying, the fun of driving cars is the same as riding a horse. I guess I should have read this first. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of driving cars is the same as riding a horse. We need a car that is like riding on horseback. So he lived another five years, passing away at 105 in Tokyo. And he has... I think in his lifetime here in spots in all the auto hall of fames, the automotive hall of fame in Detroit, in Japan, and so on and so forth. So you can thank Yutaka Kariyama for sweet Japanese sports cars. Yes. So Dylan, what's your favorite Z? Z430, Z432 fair ladies. That's the best one ever made. What, what year is that? What era is that? It's like, 
this first first gen, so what would be the 240Z? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, Z432. It's it was like a special edition of the Fair Lady in, in Japan. Uh, those are pretty cool. They got the front. Uh, they got the front mirrors on them, right? Like uh, the the mirrors up on the hood. Yeah, I like the Z31 too. Only only some of them like. They have one in Japan which had a straight six turbo engine, um, same engine that's in the Skyline, and I think that's pretty cool. Always like the three hundred as well. Yeah, yeah. I think I like them all besides the three fifty, the three seventy, and I don't think I like the new one. Oh, I was going to ask you if you if you had ever driven the new yeah. one yet. I haven't driven it, and I'm sure it's great, and it's probably better than most new cars you can buy. I just, it, to me, it still looks like a 350Z. It looks like the same car from 2003. Are you talking about like the GTR? Or? No, we're, we're talking about, so they basically the 350 and there's the 370. Right? Yeah. And then there was a kind of a break there. And then there was the new, they're just calling it the Z now. People are calling it like colloquially, I suppose it's like considered the 400Z, but people are just calling it the Z. Okay. And it's it's basically like a combination of what, you know, the old Fair Ladies, the 350, 370, but it's largely made up of a lot of parts from the 350 and the 370 most recently, like yeah. the modern ones. And yeah, I, I think they're cool. I just, I, I'm with you, Dylan. I was never a huge 350, 370 fan. I know that's like going to make a gazillion people mad if people are listening to this, but I, I don't know. Thankfully, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? They're gonna get hate mail from being on this podcast. I know exactly. I think here's my like. This is my only reasoning. Only reasoning is it like the 350 and the 370 look like they were stopped. Like the design of the body stopped at the bottom of the taillights and the headlights. Like from the (laughs) the bottom half of the car to me, just is so bulbous and not streamlined and like not following the lines of the top of the car. I've always thought that. It's like they just built a car on an upside down bathtub. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. I don't know. I think I think I could like the new C. Like if it was painted orange, for sure. I don't. I don't know. Well, what do you think? Like, so the Z is back. The Supra is back. Uh, they're doing the. I mean, that feels like the retro thing is always current, which is a weird thing to say. Fine, but, like the Supra is a BMW. I feel like there's a little bit of the like the recency bias thing where I mean 20 years from now we'll see what people say right like we're all sort of like a, you know you were in love with all this stuff that was 20 well we're talking about old. the Plymouth Prowler yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a good point man I mean, that's a good point right but yeah I feel like 20 years from now god who even knows what's gonna happen 20 years from now automotively but uh yeah but 20 years from now we'll probably be looking back realizing that those are like the best cars that they made for sure before they went all electric and weird right yeah that's yeah i'm just gonna get a one wheel (laughs) ahead of your time with the electricity right yeah (laughs) never selling my baja you want to buy it (laughs) uh i gotta ask that dylan i hear you are uh Contributing some vehicles to a museum display coming up at LeMay America's Car Museum. Yeah, yeah, I think quite a few cars. I just gave them a big list. Uh, like a, a Nissan Figaro, a Nissan 180SX, uh, an R31 Nissan Skyline, uh, Bozozoku Nissan Caravan, and like some little tiny motorcycles and whatever else I told them I had. <laughs> you got it all. Oh, that's a sweet, that's a nice, like, load of uh, interesting vehicles. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to gain a bunch of parking spaces at home now. <laughs> You're going to fill them all up by the time you have to bring those things home. I know, right? Like, <laughs> some space. Well, gentlemen, I feel like that was relatively successful. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It, it was at least something. Uh... Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening if you made it this far. And remember to drive history every day. There it is. Wham, bam. You want to hear some bonus material? Great. Here's some bonus material.
they don't record. Why? Why do hybrids, especially like back in the day, like why do they look so different, so funky? And to this day, they do. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think it's something that happened then. Like, look at all the electric cars coming out now. They all have this almost like a sheen and like a, the idea of what people think an electric car should look like. Like Hollywood has formed in our mind, like. Oh, when we have flying cars, they're going to look like these big bulby things that are flying through the air. Like everyone presumes that totally. if it's going to be this totally. electric car, it's got to look this certain way and it's got to have blue accents and it's got to have stupid wheel covers. <laughs> right. Like, or else no way could this possibly uh, be an electric car. You're so right. Like we were formed off the Jetsons. I'm still driving in the Stone Age. Well, it's like you think about Rivian, right? Like Rivian is, they just make a car that looks like a regular car. And I actually think that's a big reason why people want Rivians because it just looks like a cool, well-designed SUV. And yeah, it's electric, but you're not being hit over the head with the fact there's blue accents everywhere and it's got these really crazy light designs on it. Just a well-designed... It does have crazy lights. Look at those headlights. (laughs) (laughs) Looks like a Pixar (laughs) car. That's so true. Or one of those delivery, food delivery robots in LA. Oh, yeah. Uh, No, but that's a good point because it, I mean, Tesla really paved the way for screwing everything up <laughs> design-wise. Officially demonetized. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, fine. Bye.